We read from the Word of God as we find it in Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15. The text that God has given to us this evening is the 39th verse of this chapter. Mark 15. The Sanhedrin has had their illegal meeting during the middle of the night and now in the morning. Straightway, in the morning, the chief priests held consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and bound Jesus, and carried him away, and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answering said unto him, Thou sayest it. And the chief priests accused him of many things. But he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold how many things they witness against thee. But Jesus yet answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. And now we have in the next few verses the attempt of Pilate to trade Jesus for Barabbas. But when they cried, Crucify him, Then verse 15, And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them, and delivered Jesus, whom he had scourged, when he had scourged him, to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole band, and they clothed him with purple and plaited a crown of thorns, and put it upon his head, and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him on the head with a reed, and did spit upon him, and bowing their knees, worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him, and put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. And they compel one Simon a Cyrenian, a, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And they bring him unto the place Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of a skull. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. When they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them what every man would should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the superscription of his accusation was written over, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled with Seth, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking, said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. 
And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. We stop in our reading of the word at that point. And that last verse is to serve as the text that God gives to us tonight. When the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. As we read the account of the crucifixion, we see all kinds of different responses that were made and were given to the Lord Jesus Christ as he was crucified. Those variety of responses still take place today. Many were filled with the kind of unbelief that mocked. Others had the kind of unbelief that made them sort of shake their heads in a worldly pity and a sorrow. What a shameful sight. In the repentant malefactor, and in this Roman centurion, we have a different response. In a way, we want to say that God was speaking. God was speaking very loudly through all of the events. The Roman centurion heard God. And that's what we have to ask ourselves. In the prelude, Matt was playing, Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Well, he's here tonight. And as we gather here, God is speaking the very same things that he said then. And Peter, 2 Peter 1, if there's any thought on our part that it would have been something to have been there, actually, Peter makes it clear that we have something better, a more sure word, something that's louder, something that's clearer, something where God is still speaking and we can legitimately ask, do you hear him? Now, they all heard something. But the thief that repented and the Roman centurion, we can say, really heard. And that's our prayer for us, that we really hear tonight God's speech through the cross. We want to consider the faith of the Roman centurion, the faith that made him and led him to acknowledge truly this man, he's a man, is the Son of God. First of all, we consider the setting, the general whole setting that he saw, that centurion. Then we'll look at him and look at some of the things that he actually saw. And then finally, we want to consider the power of the Word of God in the cross. I think sometimes we call it the power of the cross, but it's more the word of God 
and the power of God's word as he spoke through those events that the centurion heard and that we are to hear. It was quiet. Really quiet. In the middle of the day. Oh, it had been loud. In the hall of Pilate, they were shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! Let him be crucified! The soldiers were loud in the praetorium when they mocked him and ridiculed him. Hail, King of the Jews! At the cross, or on the way to the cross, there were those professional weepers that wailed for those who were to be executed. During the first three hours, there was constant chatter. Chatter by those who passed by, chatter by the Roman soldiers as they argued about who could get his clothes and the clothes of the others that were crucified. There was the chatter of those who were the chief priests and the elders who made the journey out on this special day to be able to see the crucifixion. Even though they were going to be very busy and would have to get back into Jerusalem on time for the feast, they wanted to be here. And they are mocking him constantly. Not just the little bit that we read here. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And they said that in a variety of ways during those first three hours. Even we read the two malefactors, the thieves that were being crucified, joined in in their mockery of him. Until the one started to really listen. He became silent. Jesus spoke three times, once when they were nailing him and twice when he was hung up on that cross or the cross was placed in the hole, first to his mother and John and then in response to that repentant thief. And then it became quiet, dead quiet, as in the middle of the day, it became so black that nobody dared to move, to speak. A minute seemed like an hour. All they had were their own thoughts. Dead quiet. And 180 minutes went by. Not a word said. And then that 180th minute, finally, Jesus, from the height of the cross, with his piercing cry of agony, said that fourth cross word, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And immediately it was light. Immediately. As bright as the day, at the brightest point. And that's when he said, right after that light, I thirst. They ran, put a piece of sponge with vinegar on it. With a loud voice, he immediately said, It is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And his head dropped. And he was dead. When that light came, these events happened very quickly. And when that light came, 
the silence of the three hours continued. They did not have time to begin to whisper and to chatter among themselves about what they were experiencing, what they thought while it was so dark, like we would have. They didn't have time because they paid attention to what Jesus was saying. And when he dropped his head in death, then God continued to speak. He, Jesus was finished speaking, but God wasn't. And the whole earth quaked so fiercely and so powerfully that rocks tore apart, were broken. Graves in a nearby cemetery opened up. And while those at the cross and Golgotha and Calvary didn't see it, that's when the veil of the temple was rent from its 30-foot top all the way down to the bottom. In that earthquake, God spoke in judgment. And all of those who were in their silence as they had their own thoughts now heard God declare a judgment. And when you experience an earthquake, you tremble inside as well as on the outside. In Jesus' death, God spoke and proclaimed that Jesus had overcome death for those who had been recently buried. And their graves were opened. Jesus conquered death and the grave. And God declared that in those open graves. And God spoke when the veil of the temple was rent. And he shouted, the separation between me and my people is no more. Now we're together. Not under the same roof, but two rooms. But now together, in one room, we're together. I and my people. God spoke. That centurion, soldier, we don't know his name. We don't know his nationality. We don't know his history before. We don't know his history after. This is all that we know for sure about him. Many novelists have picked up the pen and typewriter and computer and have written books about him. But it's all conjecture. This is the only thing we know. We may, we may guess that he has got some age to him to be a centurion. He rose through the ranks. He's a hardened killer. He's survived battles. He's seen death. He's killed. And there he stands and he watches and he sees. He was raised, we may believe, in spiritual darkness. And the depravity of the world around him that you can find in in armies was not only surrounding him but was in his own soul too. Now in these last hours of this day he'd witnessed many things. As a Roman centurion he was undoubtedly in the palace of Pilate 
when this band of the Sanhedrin and elders came, bringing Jesus into Pilate. They had drawn their conclusion illegally in the middle of the night. They're not supposed to hold a council in a meeting during the night. But they did. They drew their conclusions. When the dawn broke, they immediately made their legal decision. And they right away bring him to Pilate. And then they began to raise all kinds of accusations against him to Pilate. The centurions in the audience. He's guarding Pilate. He's listening. He hears. He heard the Sanhedrin declare that Jesus was worthy of death because he said he was the king of the Jews. We know the implication of what Jesus said to the Sanhedrin and they might have known that conclusion too, that if he says he's king of the Jews, that he is also divine. The, the centurion witnessed Jesus' response. If Pilate marveled at Jesus' silence and, and not ready to take up his defense and to explain as all other criminals and those charged illegally would have done. Pilate marveled, and so did, Jesus, so did the centurion. At Jesus' silence, why? Why didn't he respond? Why didn't he say something in defense of himself? Why didn't he explain? When Jesus was taken to the praetorium and scourged and mocked and ridiculed, the centurion was there too to watch. He took Jesus to Herod and brought him back. And he saw that discourse between Herod and again Jesus' silence. He listened to the wailers. He saw the ridicule. He heard Jesus say, as his soldiers were kneeling, Words he never heard one being crucified ever say. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He heard it. He saw his concern for his mother. He heard his word to the repentant malefactor, today with me in paradise. He heard the volume of the voice every time Jesus spoke he saw his shame as he hung there naked and then the centurion experienced the darkness the utter blackness so thick he could feel it Luke 23 verse 47 speaks generally he saw all that happened Matthew 27 says he watched Jesus and with them that were with him he experienced the earthquake and more. Our text in verse 39 emphasizes that he not only saw those things but he saw the nature of Jesus dying. Remember, he's a soldier. He'd killed. He'd seen death. And now that Jesus cried with a loud voice, something that nobody, after hanging for six hours, had the ability to do. But Jesus did, with a loud voice. He heard the cry. He watched. And he saw that Jesus died. He knew. He knew death. And he knew when Jesus had dropped that he was dead after commending his spirit to the Father. And then he felt the earthquake. When he saw all those things, he revealed that he had a heart that had been opened by the Lord.
one more time. We have to ask ourselves, what do you hear? Not just with the outer ear, but with the ear of the heart. Do you hear God? Do you hear him proclaim that he so loved that he gave his son? Twice Jesus addressed God as Father. The centurion knew that he was speaking to God. Once he called him God, but twice he called him Father. That registered. How could he call God Father? Do you hear him? Because if he calls God Father, then God gave his only begotten Son. Romans 5. The evidence, the clearest evidence and manifestation of God's love is that while we're yet sinners, God gave his Son and his son gave himself for us. It's likely that he saw the blood and the water flow mingled down. He saw the blood and the sorrow flow mingled down. And as arrogant and as strong and as a mighty soldier as he was, that's when he said, May all my pride be crucified. May I boast in nothing save in the cross. God's speech was unavoidably heard by all who were there. Everybody heard. How many people don't hear today in the church world and in all of the world around us, especially in our civilization, as we know this to be Good Friday. And then soon, resurrection, Easter. God speaks so loudly, unbelievers see and hear. Some might go to the stations of the cross And all they do is wag their heads. What a sad thing happened. There's a worldly sorrow. But you've got to repent of that. Many can be impressed at what Jesus, the man Jesus, bore. And then there are those who think that the right way to portray it is to have somebody bloodied and drag a cross through the streets of Jerusalem or through streets today. And all they see is a man. And they are saddened that such injustice would ever be done. But not my sin.
The first thing that the centurion did in Luke 23, verse 47, is there it's recorded that he said, this is a righteous man. And in declaring Jesus to be a righteous man and saying it publicly, something that those soldiers were trained, you keep your mouth shut. You don't contradict what Pilate declared. But he opened his mouth and he said, this is a righteous man. And in saying that, he contradicted the decree of, of Pilate that Jesus be crucified. And he contradicted all of those chief priests that had been saying, hey, king of the Jews, come on down and we'll believe you. They declared him to be guilty. They wanted him killed. The centurion said, He's a righteous man. And then he added this. Truly, and may, if we put the two together, it would go like this. Truly, this righteous man is the Son of God. Do you know what it takes to be able to say that a man is God? It takes election. Roman, or Acts 13, verse 48. As many as had been ordained to eternal life believed. What God did in ordaining before time began, and He ordained them unto eternal life in the eternity to come, from one eternity to the other eternity. He ordained them to eternal life, and in time they believed. And what did they believe according to election? The first evidence, the first infallible fruit of election. Canons 1.12 True faith in Jesus Christ. Because true faith in Jesus Christ is the ability to believe that Jesus is God. We all know John 3.16a. The best part is B. So loved God the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him, God gave His Son. Whosoever believeth in God's Son shall have everlasting life, shall never perish. For he who believes shall not be condemned, but he who believes not is condemned already. It takes a gift of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3, Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God will call Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. No man can say that Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. 1 John 4, verse 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, is of God. He came into flesh. He was before flesh. He was God. And He entered into flesh to be able to confess that Jesus was God who came into flesh, is of God, is born of God, is begotten of God, as he says it in the text that we considered this morning in Bible study, or yesterday morning. Amazing. To be able to say that Jesus is God, this little word, this short confession of faith, this righteous man surely is the Son of God. 
is to say everything. Everything that you have to say. It's to be a proclaimer, a proclamation that one is saved by grace. And here's why. I was working this week not only on this text, but also on Lord's Day 5 in preparation for next week, Sunday morning. How can we again be received into favor with God if Lord's Day 4 says we're going to be judged for being such totally depraved sinners and God must judge us? How can we ever be received into favor with God again? And the answer is, the only way is that there has to be a satisfaction made and that satisfaction can be made and must be made only by one who is man, who is righteous man, and who is God. Now look at here. This righteous man is God. He said it. Satisfaction can be made and we can be again received into favor with God. And you may know that about yourself. When you believe, and find in yourself the ability to hear God say, through all of the events of the cross, truly, this righteous man is God. And the first powerful implication of that is this. He had to be God. To take away my sin. My sin. So to say that Jesus is the Son of God, you're saying a ton about yourself. I had the privilege of another Bible study this week at Sunset Manor. The Bible study began at Romans 4.25. He was delivered. That word delivered isn't just offered up, gave up. Delivered is a legal official word that whereby God performs an action and declares Jesus worthy of death. He was delivered unto death on account of our transgressions. Our offenses. So if you say that's the Son of God who's being crucified, then you are saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Because it took God to cover all my sin and all my sinfulness. That's what that centurion was saying when he made that confession. He's divine, but he had to be to do what God sent him to do. In the darkness, God sent light into the soul of a previously darkened soul. And he gave him eyes. And in that light, and with those eyes, this child of God saw. He heard, he saw, he confessed. What do you confess tonight? Is this just a little pause in our busyness? Have we got more to do tonight, tomorrow, next week? Or does this speech of God ring? So that pricked, 
deep within. First, we say, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. But then we see there's the Son of God. And not only did it take and require the Son of God, but He is the Son of God and He did accomplish it. And so I'm going to sing. Love, so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast. May I burn everything I want to brag about. And my, may I only lift up the cross of the righteous man who is the Son of God. Now sing. Now be not silent. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. That's how we started, and that's how we want to end. He died for me, and now he's worthy of my love and my obedience and my song. My song forever shall record the tender mercies of the Lord. Amen. All we can say, Father, is thanks. We thank Thee for such a gift, for so unworthy sinners. We marvel. We hear thee. We hear. And our grief is that we're going to keep going on in our sinning. But our joy is that thou changest not. Hold us. Don't let us go. We trust in thee with all our heart. And we acknowledge thee in all our ways. Thou art God, and Thou art so good always to us. In Jesus' name, amen.